Jackson. Shooting 67 weddings last year. Taylor Jackson, welcome. So Taylor, you are well known in this community. You're an amazing photographer. Welcome to today's video. I have five things to talk to you about in pricing for photography. And number one, I'll do the, the bullet points. I got them here on my phone. Number one is the best piece of advice that I have heard recently in pricing for photography. Number two is the trap to not fall into, a pricing trap that a lot of us, uh, at least when we're trying to learn online, we fall into that. Number three is how I actually stepped my pricing up from somebody just entering the industry to really an established professional. Number four, is how to find a starting rate, which I think is a bit of a struggle. It was definitely a bit of a struggle for me. Um, I really put a lot of time and effort into that and I never thought that I was doing it right. And number five will hopefully reframe how you think about pricing overall. If you don't know me, I'm Taylor Jackson. I'm a wedding photographer primarily, but I also do a number of other photography related jobs kind of all around this area here, which is kind of outside of Toronto. In Canada and then also all around the world. Um, I photograph anywhere between 60 and 70 weddings every single year which is a lot but I really do believe that wedding photography it's it's a lot of fun for me so hopefully hopefully it's fun for you. If, if you're on the fence about wedding photography maybe check out some videos on my channel you might have a, a, a different understanding of what wedding photography might be and you might believe that you hate it and it might turn out to be the greatest job of your life. Um, that's kind of what happened to me that I was very hesitant to get into the industry and then all of a sudden I was like ah like maybe this is a, a, an avenue to make some money with the, doing the thing that I love and the first few weddings sucked. I had definitely the incorrect clients. They, they We didn't connect. I was a button pusher. I was treated as such and it was really a struggle but then I started booking my ideal clients and, I, and things became a heck of a lot better and it really does become kind of the best job I think in photography. Uh, but maybe don't tell everyone because then there's going to be too many people in the industry. Um, I have just released my elopements course. Uh, so if you're a follower of the channel, you probably know this. But what I do is I release a new course every single month. And if you're a member over on the member site, you get access to all of them. So you sign up once. Even if you sign up for the month, you get access to one instantly everything that's up there, including my presets, including my off-camera flash guide for wedding photographers and uh, introvert's guide to posing. And there's a lot of stuff over there. Head over there, check it out. Uh, but you'll also get this elopements course that just came out a couple of days ago. Uh, essentially what it is is last week within seven days I generated 57 leads for local weddings and I was generating a few organically but this really is a strategy if you if you want to start attracting leads in a massive way uh, very very quickly. The entire wedding photography industry to speak to that quickly has changed entirely that what we used to call elopements is now just the normal way that weddings happen. I think that elopements used to be kind of those two to ten 10 person weddings that would happen up on, on mountaintops and you take helicopters there. Now an elopement I would say is pretty much what's happening for at least the rest of the year. And this is how I generated 57 leads for those style of weddings within one full week. And the other huge benefit if you are wanting to build your portfolio or you're wanting to make money in photography right now is it Almost all of those weddings, with the exception of two, were happening within this calendar year. Um, you know, I'm in the Northern Hemisphere, so things get cold around November. Everything pretty much was happening before the end of October. So uh, this is the only year in the history of wedding photography that I've ever had such a significant demand for what I would consider to be a last minute wedding. So if you're interested in, in booking yourself some of those, uh, so far to date, I think I've booked about 18 of them. I think 14 was when I recorded the course. I think I was up to that point. Um, and then I think it's up to about 18 bookings now from those weddings. And then also referrals out of those leads that come in, which is, which is very, very interesting. Let's get to the pricing points. Point number one, the best advice that I have heard recently is actually from a dude that you might follow on YouTube. His name is Sean Tucker. He's a very, he's a very well-spoken and very, you feel like you're having a conversation with him in all, all of his videos. He mentioned something and I hope that he doesn't mind me kind of rehashing this to at least kind of fit my mindset. But basically that people don't know that when somebody comes to your website for the first time, a lot of people don't know the difference between good work and bad work when it comes to photography. We live in this space, we know what good work is, we know what bad work is. A lot of couples, especially in the commercial end of things, they will come to your website and they really will read the quality of your work from your price, which is not something that, that I love. So people really don't know the difference between good quality, bad quality work, but what they will rely on is price as an indicator. So if you're priced way below where you should be, you're going to scare a lot of couples away. You're going to scare a lot of clients away because they just don't know. They're very, it makes them very uncertain. So people will read 
and judge your photography based on price, unfortunately. So you have to be at least kind of in the ballpark of, of where you think that you should be. So point number one, people don't know the difference between good quality, bad quality work, and they will judge your work based on your price tag and, and how much. And I think there's another level to this as well that's kind of outside of the scope maybe of this video, but people will also invest the amount of money that they believe that they are worth. So if you have somebody that believes that they are actually worth uh, paying a high price point because they want that luxury level service, they're going to be paying that. And if even if you have the portfolio and you have everything together and you have the package, the, the thing that they want, if you're priced too low, some people just won't buy it because it's, it's not expensive enough for them and they're worth they're worth spending more something something to think about point number two is a trap that I have mentioned a few times I just want to further solidify this so if maybe this is the first video you're ever watching from my channel um, the trap is that a lot of if you type into Google like how to price my photography you're going to come up with a lot of calculators and those calculators will run through things like insurance and gear spend and and then it'll eventually be like add your profit margin and unfortunately the market doesn't care about that at all, that it doesn't care if you cover your expenses. It's nice to have a number or a rough number that's like, hey, this is kind of what it costs me to live. But unfortunately, the market doesn't care about that. And if you're first getting into photography and you're, you're trying to figure out how to price your photography, that is one of the biggest traps. That if you're trying to price basically to, to cover all of your expenses and also make profit margin and um, all of those things considered, you're gonna be quite an expensive photographer. And while your skill level might be there, Unfortunately, the work that you've generated so far might not be at the level that maybe other people are charging. So there's going to be a disconnect. The market is, it, there is some emotion in it, but for the most part, it's pretty emotionless and it doesn't care too much about, about you and your needs. So you have to find a way to get into it and to kind of scale it up, which is going to actually lead us in to point number three. I step my pricing up very organically. So point number three is how to step your pricing up uh, in a way that makes sense. In weddings specifically, I'll speak to that and then I'll speak to commercial in kind of a different thread here. In weddings, everything, I guess maybe this is, I'll, I'll put an asterisk here. Everything is a one-off sale in regards to weddings. The, the asterisk is that the one-off sale, build an email list and remarket families, maternity photos, baby photos uh, down the road to the same people because it's not really a one-off sale. For the wedding itself, it's a one-off sale. And the benefit of that is that it's a, you're never gonna sell the same thing to, this, to that couple again, which means that you're able to incrementally step your pricing up. And as long as you're doing it within reason, you're usually not burning your entire referral chain. So basically if a, if a bridesmaid that's at that wedding now emails me and is like, hey Taylor, we'd love to have you shoot our wedding and maybe you're $300 more expensive than you were last year, that's not gonna be too much of a disconnect. If you're bouncing, like if you're going from maybe $600 one year to $1,800 next year to, to $4,500 the next year, maybe that's gonna be a bit of a disconnect and you're gonna burn that referral chain. So know that if you're stepping up pricing aggressively like that to get to a point that, that you believe that you should be at, uh, know that you are going to have to do things that are a lot more kind of hard marketing, uh, stuff that I actually would talk about in the in the elopements course to generate leads and to generate new clients and um, rather than relying simply on that referral chain. So say you're in the wedding space and you wanna step up your pricing. Say your first wedding ever is $600. Your next wedding ever maybe should be seven, eight, nine hundred dollars Next wedding ever, $1,200. And keep stepping up incrementally like that. I did kind of $300 jumps in the beginning. I'm Canadian dollars, which is roughly ish equivalent to the United States market. Um, so if you're somewhere else in the world, dollars, I guess is what I'm speaking in. Um, so I incrementally jumped by about $200, $300 kind of each individual wedding. And then when I got to what I felt to be a plateau, which was bumping myself over that $2,000 mark, I started doing a thing where I would remove things from the packages rather than stepping myself over that mark because quite honestly, it's, it's a little bit scary to be like, I'm worth this much now, I hope people still inquire. And the, the benefit is that it seems that the more you get close to what you should actually be at as far as kind of pricing goes, the more accepting the market actually is to your work. So when you become a photographer that has the portfolio to back being in that specific price point that even if it seems to be an oversaturated market in your area, uh, once you have the portfolio and at least a little bit of the experience and people can go through and background check and oh yeah, they, this guy has been working, this girl has been working for a couple of years now. Once they're able to do that background check on you, at that point I feel like it becomes a lot easier to book that if you are underpricing the market or overpricing the market, you're not gonna see as much acceptance. But if you are in what is the quote unquote oversaturated market, it will 
be a lot more accepting for you overall because that's again the market that's been made don't try to fight against it don't try to build your own market if you're just one person trying to be like wedding photography here should be worth eight thousand dollars you're gonna you're gonna find a lot of resistance again the market doesn't really care who you are and people in general are going to be just they're gonna they're gonna find a disconnect if you're too cheap or you're too expensive so incrementally step up and make sure that you still have inquiries coming in which is why it's important to step up whenever you do make those bookings going back to commercial the challenge with that is that if you start off way too low it's going to be very difficult to step your pricing up um, as long as you're working with the same clients so what i personally did um, i didn't necessarily just completely ditch my old client catalog but i would be working with certain people i would book new jobs at new rates and then depending on how much I wanted to continue doing that work with that person, I would either give them the new rates and if they were non-responsive to that or if they were a client that I knew just might not ever make that jump, I would refer them to somebody else that I knew was still kind of in that, that building price point. So in that sense, you're kind of looking after your friends, which will hopefully look after you eventually once you all kind of get to the same spot. And then again, to kind of go back to point two about if you're searching online for how to price your photography, you'll find a lot of calculators as well that go in detail about kind of if, if you're doing that if you're doing say something for international distribution and you put all the the numbers in that are approximately going to maybe be that ad spend that they're going to buy on it and then you price your photography out on that I found living in a smaller town and living outside of what I would consider to be a huge advertising market that those are all wildly inaccurate and no one will bite at a lot of the prices that you're seeing from those. So if you're typing that in and you're being like, well, I can make like $85,000 for like one day of one day of work. This sounds awesome. I'm going to get into, into product. You're probably going to find a lot of resistance unless you live in one of the big markets and you become somebody that has a name that can command that level of value that you really are the only person in the world that photographs like shoes in that way or whatever it might be. You really do have to niche down and pick something very specific if you're interested in something like that. Living in, I'm an hour outside of Toronto here, 500,000 people, local area. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities and actually in September, the course that I'm going to be bringing out is all about those commercial photography opportunities in your local area for social media, for product, and how to actually price those in a, in a real life situation rather than the, the internet life situation, which I think is a little bit crazy. Again, it comes down to location. If you live in New York City, you're in Manhattan, like you, you can definitely go by those calculators. But if you're in small town Canada, small town America, small town United Kingdom, Australia, whatever it might be, um, there are there there are levels of resistance that you're going to see if you're trying to price really aggressively and to, to price really beyond what the market is capable of. Um, there's also, I guess, the option to maybe just go 35, 38 more seconds into this. Um, there's an option of creating work that didn't exist before as well. That um, That's what I'm going to speak to in, in September in the course is that really everything that we've done didn't really exist, that no one had that package that you could approach a a company and be like, hey, here's what we do. Here's like a one page website, not a, I didn't door to door. You could door to door if you wanted um, in your local area. Uh, I sent out a website and that one sheet is basically, do you want your entire social media catalog covered for the entire month or for the year? And people are like, well, that sounds pretty good. You've made this very easy on me. Check. I'll send you the PayPal link through the, through the buy now and, and we'll schedule a shoot. So that's coming in September. If you're a member, if you sign up for the elopements course, you'll get that as well. And number five, the last pricing point today. This is something that Chase Jarvis said a long, long time ago. Chase Jarvis is the, I guess, founder of Creative Live, co-founder of Creative Live. Uh, for a long time, he was the only dude making really good behind the scenes content in the space. And um, there are some interviews that he was actually receiving death threats because he was essentially blowing the commercial industry wide open and being like, hey, here's how I do a shoot for TaylorMade. And he would bring you on the golf course and he would, he would shoot everything and show you the full behind the scenes. People got very angry. Photography at that time was a very closed industry. Uh, Chase kinda, I would say at least on in, through video, opened that or at least was one of the, the leaders through that door. He eventually started Creative Live, which I'm sure you're aware of, has a lot of, a lot of content on there now. Um, he said, I'm not even sure where it is. It was a long, long time ago, but there's really no way to turn a $10 client into a $1,000 client. So if somebody's in there and they're paying you 10 bucks, they're never going to be the client that's going to pay you $1,000, that that gap is just too big for them to, to span. So 
while you're stepping up your pricing, know that you are going to be burning off a lot of your referral chain and even some some of those clients that helped you get started. If they're friends, they become friends. Like obviously, continue doing the work and and find something and just through honesty and and talking to them, find find the spot that actually works financially for them as well as you. Um, that I'm customizable in that sense. If it's somebody that I enjoy working with, if they're making my life easy, if the, the work is fun, if, if I enjoy just going in to, to do it, I'm okay to price according to that. And especially if there's somebody that helped me get started and helped me get my first couple of paychecks in photography. If there's somebody that has become a nightmare client, they are never fun to work with. And I would say the majority of clients that you're going to find at the, the early stages, that, that $10 quote unquote level, are going to be very difficult to work with. They're going to be very much people that want that button pusher and they want everything for no money and they're they're going to be very difficult clients. So I would suggest maybe moving from them as fast as you can if you sense those red flags in the beginning. I think that in the starting stages, you have to put up with a certain number of red flags that you still do need that work, you need that paycheck. So I was a little more, I guess, forgiving in the beginning of that. Now, as I've built my business, I've been in the industry for over 15 years now. As I've built my business, I really do focus on what brings me the most happiness. And I will take, I will deny jobs that have good paychecks based on the fact that they seem like it's either going to be a nightmare to do the work or the, the post-production is too demanding and I can't hire somebody to do it. Or or there's travel involved that I just don't want to go and do because it's going to take me away from the things that I actually enjoy doing here. So um, maybe this is the, the sixth bonus tip that if you are getting into photography, really do find the, the kind of the balance of what is fun for you and what brings you life happiness as well as what pays the bills. For me, and uh, I'll stop preaching wedding photography, no, I'll just keep talking about wedding photography forever. The the thing that I found in the middle was wedding photography that I got to do essentially weddings become product photography. You're, you're photographing rings and shoes and um, all kinds of content. So you get to do that aspect. It's landscape photography in a sense that you're out usually in a beautiful location and you get to get those landscape shots and you can also bring in as much of that as you kind of want to. Uh, what I've discovered recently is that when I, for instance, on this helicopter elopement that you're going to see in a couple of days on YouTube, I spent a little bit of time probably not even 10 minutes, just photographing landscape images for the couple, I would say. Like, I, I want to make them landscape art that they can put in their house, potentially, but then also have it have the meaning of the fact that it was their wedding day and that they were on this island. And while this, this canvas print that they're now going to have is nice to look at, it also has a significant meaning to them as well. Um, not a lot of my clients, I'm, I'm, I guess it kind of goes both ways. It's a bit weird if you walk into a client's house and they have like a 40-foot print of their wedding photo of them smiling facing the camera or really anything involving them it becomes a little bit too much so in weddings I do my best to kind of create that art for their home knowing that they're they're not going to want to put their face in a huge canvas likely some some do here in Waterloo Ontario we love motorcycles a lot of people aren't going to put their face on a huge canvas in their home so I do my best to create some some landscape work that does go very nicely or some architecture work or uh, like bricks or whatever it might be just some details that I know could end up as art in their home and I deliver all of those and so far everybody's been pretty happy with it and I, I think that's pretty cool so wedding photography can be product it can be landscape it's obviously portraiture obviously photographing people working with people which was the hardest thing for me in the beginning it was very stressful for myself as a very introverted quiet person to now be in control of people and be like Okay, now put your hands here, hold hands, walk that way, H hug each other, please. Kiss, wear a kiss, forehead kiss, I don't know, Ar arm kiss, K kiss her hand, kiss, kiss, kiss his, his side. Wedding photography was very weird for, for me to get into, and especially my age at that time when I was starting to photograph people and f photographing strangers, I was very, very young and there was a social gap as well. Uh, so that was very difficult for me to overcome in the beginning. Uh, eventually, You'll get there if, if you're stressed out about this. There's a, a lot of videos on the channel and also a lot of videos in um, the member site as well if you're interested. So maybe check those out if you're interested in kind of my mindset when it comes to posing and to putting couples in, in places that, that make sense together and also not making it too hard on yourself. And then weddings have an event aspect, so you get to do that event style coverage. And if you want to shoot the stars outside the barn after the wedding, you can do that. If you want to involve the couple in those astro photos, you can also do that. So there's lots of different options and it's really kind of whatever 
whatever direction you want to take it. Obviously, you have to stay true to the portfolio that the couple booked you on, but there you really do have a lot of artistic liberties within the day. And I think the biggest thing to kind of bring this back to, to happiness is the biggest thing for me was my time freedom that when I was working a nine to five, I was very much stressed out with the fact that I had to go to this office and I had to sit there and I had to wait until five. And even if I finished all my work and I was super efficient and I was done by noon, I still had to sit there till five. It was really dumb. And then if you're efficient, you just start doing more work and then that becomes part of your job. I didn't like that so much because I didn't really get paid extra for doing doing that more work. So my mindset coming into photography was really to unlock the most amount of time freedom as possible. When looking at weddings, you definitely have to be somewhere on a Saturday or most Saturdays. Now elopements are like Tuesdays, Thursdays, Wednesdays. I have a lot of weird dates coming up. Uh, most of the time, most normal years, weddings are on Saturdays. And you have to physically be there on a Saturday. Maybe you have to physically be there for an engagement session. And maybe in the past you had to go to an in-person meeting. So for a wedding, you're looking at three days, maybe total, that you have to physically be at home for. Um, as my business has continued to evolve, I've really gotten rid of the in-person meetings, um, I guess this year especially. I'm pretty much entirely phone call based now, not even Skype, not even FaceTime, we just talk on the phone. I've found that I'm the most comfortable in that space and also the it's a techno, like the least technology that has to go into it as well. Um, so I found that that's kind of my happy place when it comes to to client meetings. Uh, engagement sessions, I would say that I'm seeing less and less and less every single year. I'm probably down to this year, maybe 25% of my wedding couples are having engagement sessions. And the rest of the time, come show up on the Saturday, do a good job, and then the other six days out of that week, I can kind of be anywhere. And I'm sure if you are if you follow the channel, you definitely see how much we travel on a normal year and that we are very, very rarely uh, home that I would say probably two weeks out of every month, I'm, I'm somewhere doing a thing. And that is all because of the time freedom that wedding photography initially allowed me. And then I began doing those break even style trips. There's on the member site, there's uh, more details than that. And I'm also going to be redoing the how to travel the world for nearly free course as well. So if you're interested in essentially setting up as many break even trips for yourself as possible, that they're not gonna be the first trip that you do, you're not gonna get a paycheck from it. This is basically using your photography and potentially video skills to, to generate content on the road in order to pay for travel. For the first couple of years, just to break even to get, like we went to Africa uh, and we went on a proper safari and we didn't make a lot of money, but we got to do the super cool thing. Uh, so if you're, if you're okay with that for the first little bit, I feel like there are a lot of opportunities and there are even more opportunities this year than ever before just because of the travel industry trying to recover. Um, so the How to Travel World for Nearly Free course, we'll call it October. That'll be the next one. So I'll do the commercial course September and then we'll do How to Travel the World for Nearly Free in October. And if I get it out early, if I finish it all, I'll, I'll schedule it out before then as well. So um, yeah, lots of content coming to the member site if you're interested, uh, but get that elopements course now if you're interested because I think that that is the most time sensitive of anything I've released because once all of the weddings from kind of the next month have already booked people, there's not this style of industry is not going to return, I don't believe. So um, as soon as winter, at least Northern Hemisphere, if you're in, in New Zealand or wherever, then maybe you got a little lead on this. Uh, but at least this year, as soon as winter hits, all these weddings are going to slowly kind of disappear. And in my mindset, like winter weddings and winter elopements are at least they're a lot more challenging, I think, photographically. So I would much rather do as many of these earlier um, before it gets it gets snowy and cold up here. I would much rather do a lot of those weddings rather than waiting like three months to put the strategy in place and then booking maybe a couple over the winter. A lot of couples, I feel like, are in the same boat that they really just wanted to get married this year and everything is obviously pushed against that and they've had to change their wedding dates and they really just want to get married to their partner now. So the easier you can make that, the better, the more elopements and small weddings you're going to book. So head over to the site right now if you're interested in that. It is online right now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow, I guess. Maybe. It might be two days. Give me some edit time with the, the helicopter elopement. I want to make it good. See you there.